Well, I would like to go ahead and introduce our speaker for today. And I am just absolutely delighted that Amy Evans was able to join us today. Um, I've uh, gotten to know Amy through her work with Foodways um, and through her involvement with Foodways Texas. Um, but Amy has a um, long and wonderful career as an artist, as an educator, as a writer, as an oral historian, as a documentarian. Um, and uh, she's presented in uh, my graduate classes before about her fabulous work. Um, and I'm so glad that she was able to make it here today for this presentation. Um, as I mentioned, Amy Evans is an award-winning artist, writer, educator, documentarian, and oral historian. And she's a native Houstonian. Uh, she has a BFA in printmaking from the Maryland Institute uh, College of Art and a master's in Southern Studies from the University of Mississippi. Her paintings have appeared in Southern Living and Southern Cultures and on CNN's Etocracy and the Oxford American blog. And her writing has been featured in Savoir Magazine, The Bitter Southerner, uh, The Local Palette, and Cornbread Nation 5, The Best of Southern Food Writing. Uh, she basically built the documentary program uh, at the Southern Foodways Alliance, which is headquartered at the University of Mississippi, uh, where she was the lead oral historian for more than a decade. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to see this, and I think she'll share with us the website and where you can find some of this work, um, she, some of the, the films and uh, documentaries that have been produced by the Southern Foodways Alliance, as well as the Oral History Archive, are um, some of the best that I've seen that speak to uh, sort of southern history and food history um, in really beautiful ways. In her art, in her documentary work, and in her oral history work, um, Amy is a gifted storyteller, Ooh. but also, I would say, a story cultivator, um, because she skillfully gets people to tell their own stories, um, and they inspire her work um, in so many different ways. Uh, whether she's teaching um, through various programs, like the Literacy Through Photography program, the Writers in Schools programs here in Houston and the Young um, Audiences uh, of Houston programs, um, or whether she's working in other kind of documentary work. Um, her, her, her skills are really impressive. And today she's going to be sharing some of her latest work, um, an ongoing multimedia project called My Houston, in which she documents her hometown through paintings, photos, and oral histories. And with that, please join me in welcoming Amy Evans. Thank you, Monica. So as you might imagine, when people ask me what I do, it's kind of hard to answer. Um, but I call myself an artist and storyteller, basically. Um, I think that encapsulates a lot of the things that I do. Um, and I was an artist uh, before I was a documentarian, and now I've come back around and I'm trying to combine the two. So um, who in here is interested in oral history? Who in here is interested in art? Who in here is interested in storytelling? in any of its wonderful forms. Okay, captive audience. So um, I uh, have, have been turning in lots of circles <laughs> and chasing my tail, but um, I'll give you a little bit about my uh, background and how I got to the Southern Foodways Alliance because that was really the start of my career as a documentarian and really informs all the work that I do now. Um, but so I am from Houston. I went to the high school for performing and visual arts, which was a very formative experience for me in visual art. And then I went to art school at Maryland Institute College of Art. Then I lived in deep south Savannah, Georgia for a while. And I just spent a year there, but I, that experience still in, informs uh, a lot of what I do. And then I moved back to Houston, was here a lot of years and realized this wasn't the end of the road for me. And so I looked at graduate school as a way to kind of try in another place for size, have it mean something, you know, take an, uh, the, the road less taken or whatever, and uh, kind of experiment with my future. <laughs> so I, I landed at the Southern Studies program at the Center for the Study of Southern Culture at the University of Mississippi because, um, for one, they have an interdisciplinary program, and so they have a documentary arm of the program, which I was attracted to because it incorporates photography. I figured I sh could still be visually creative while still exploring the history and culture of the American South. I was interesting and interested in the history part of it. I've always been interested in history in general as a subject. And then I was interested in the Southern, the Deep South part of it, because uh, my mom's side of the family is from Alabama, and I've always been kind of fascinated in my personal family history. 
And as I was applying to graduate schools, I also audited some classes in Southern history at Rice University to see if I had the academic chops after being in art school for a long time. And I just ate it up. I just knew that this is something that I wanted to do. Um, but I got a hold of the book Salvation on Sand Mountain by Dennis Covington, which came out in the late 90s. And um, he, if I'm remembering correctly, was an, a reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, but then spent time in North Alabama studying the Pentecostal church. And my mom's people are from the Sound Ma Mountain region of Alabama. And so I just kind of went down that wormhole and that, ran that interest ran parallel to my seeking out graduate school experiences. And then I made a road trip to visit the places that I applied to because I, um, I have an artist mentor who is uh, a lot older and wiser than I am and he suggested that since I'm kind of coming from left, left field as an artist, that I should visit the programs and kind of plead my case in person. So I applied to Rice, um, and I applied to the University of Mississippi, and I also applied to the folklore program at UNC Chapel Hill. And I was teaching at HSPVA at, at the time, and I took a road trip to visit these campuses. And as, right before I took the road trip, I got an email from my mother's cousin, who is kind of the family historian, who sent me a letter that my grandfather wrote to his sister when he was principal at the Woodville School in Woodville, Alabama, in North Central Alabama. And this is all to tell how serendipitous all of these kind of points on my timeline that is my career have happened. So I've just kind of followed my heart in a lot of ways for um, good or bad. But this is kind of what set me on my tra trajectory that got me here in 2018. So year 2000, I'm on this road trip exploring graduate schools and I just received a, a scan of this letter from my grandfather and the the letter was written on Woodville School stationery. So after I went to Mississippi and I visited the program at the University of Mississippi, I drove through North Alabama to get to North Carolina, see a sign for Woodville, pull off the road, go to the school, go to the front office, said this sounds crazy, but my grandfather was W.R. Riley. Oh yeah, he was the principal in the 20s. The old school burned down, but Miss So-and-so, who teaches on the eighth grade hall, her mother was a student in that time, and she'll tell you how to find her mom. Anyway, long story short, I made friends with this 80-something-year-old woman who was a student when my grandfather was principal at the school, generated a relationship with her. Anyway, so, and I'm going to come back around to more serendipitous moments like that, but that kind of following your gut and taking the road less taken and connecting with random people is kind of like my motto in life. <laughs> and it's, it's how I, it's how I navigate, navigate my daily life and it's how I interact with my work and, and pursue my work in every arena. So I went, obviously ended up going to the University of Mississippi and uh, start enrolled in 2001, got my master's in Southern Studies did uh, classes in field work and documentary photography and everything else. It was a really great experience and I love being in Mississippi. Um, I love being in a really small town after living in lots of cities and growing up in Houston. And then as I was a graduate student, I got a graduate assistantship with the Southern Foodways Alliance, which at that time was only three years old. So it was a very new organization. And as I was um, working in my assistantship, they turned their attention to documenting the foodways of the American South. And so I did just some really crazy off the wall projects with a fellow student and current colleague, um, Joe York, who's done a lot of the SFA films over the years. Um, and then I did the first kind of formal oral history project for Southern Foodways in 2003. And that was in Greenwood, Mississippi. And it kind of, not it kind of, it definitely uh, ended up being the formula for everything we did after that. So this is the Southern Foodways Alliance re website, southernfoodways.org. And if you go to the oral history section, it will bring you here. And so um, I don't know how many oral histories are, there are here. I think now there are about a thousand. Um, I'm gonna take you to the very first one. They're also redesigning re their website, so I think a lot of the media is um, not, 
I don't want to do that. Let's see. Come on. No. Uh, all the media is not current, but I'll show you this. So we're going to go to Mississippi. And so we started collecting oral histories in our, our backyard of Oxford. So we looked at the Mississippi Delta. We did um, projects in Memphis, which is just an hour away. And I will tell you that in 2003, when I did this oral history project in Greenwood, I used a cassette recorder and I used a film camera. <laughs> so a lot has happened since then. But one thing that has not changed is that um, this computer is, it has a mind of its own, I'm so sorry. Uh, let's do it this way. Um, uh, so a lot of change, but what hasn't changed is that early on when we were kind of figuring out what we wanted to do with the oral history program, uh, a lot of what we did was kind of trial by fire and, and breaking all the rules because we didn't know any better, um, but also taking advantage of technology. And so we were really committed in the very beginning to making everything accessible to the widest audience possible. And so we took full advantage of the internet. And the internet, of course, has changed since then. But all of our archive is, or all of their archive, I'm no longer an employee of the SFA, I'll get to that, but um, their archive is all available online. And so everything, their, their full transcripts that are downloadable, there are audio clips, there are still photographs, and then there are short audio slideshows that marry the still photographs with the audio. And um, that has always been a part of the archive. And because we wanted, uh, again, to not just kind of shove everything away in the file, file cabinet in archives and special collections, but have it be accessible to wide audience and most specifically available to the people who share their stories with us. So I cannot tell you the benefits of, um, you know, having people who share their story get to see themselves be celebrated on this kind of public format. Also a byproduct of that is for somebody who owns a restaurant that's kind of free advertising for them sharing their story. So there are a lot of different um, reasons that we've done that. And I presented our work at the Oral History Association's annual meeting, I think it was back in 2014. And um, it was really amazing to get some kind of affirmations and validations from that academic community for sharing so much social history through food to a public audience and disseminating in, the, in this way. And so these are some of the stories I collected um, another thing about doing this work is a lot of these people are no longer with us. Um, the gentleman who owns the Cotton Row Club has passed. Mike Ballas has passed. Mabel Gilman has passed. Johnny Bell has passed. The senior gardenias have passed. The Lescos are still with us. Maddie is still with us. But so anyway, so, um, I'll just take you to Pearl Johnson's page, and you can see how there's audio clip, photography, download the transcript, and this is, should we play this? Should I take that chance? Do you want to play it? I haven't looked at this in forever. The audio quali quality, I can tell you, is going to be terrible. Uh, volume on a PC. Here we go. Oh, okay. Well, go home and get your headphones <laughs> and listen to Pearl Johnson from 2003. It's crazy. Um, so yeah, so I, I did that work. I, you know, I played archivist, played photographer, played field work, you know, collector. Um, and did that work until 2014 which is when I moved back home to be closer to family. Uh, I worked remotely for the SFA for a while, but it just it didn't make sense because Houston doesn't really care a lot about things outside of Houston. So working <laughs> and documenting the Deep South, there was a big disconnect there. So um, I resigned from the SFA and uh, embarked on a freelance career, just kind of by the nature of where, where I found myself and went back to painting. And what's funny is that the whole time that I was uh, doing documentary work, um, I continued painting because I've had a relationship with the gallery here for 20 years, Kelch Gallery that's on Richmond and Stanford. 
Um, I've stood with them forever. And so I still had an annual exhibit with them. And so as I was an oral historian, a lot of my field work was informing my paintings. And so I was always curious about if and when I had more time to devote my, to my paintings, what that would look like. And what it looks like is this. So um, I'll tell you that Art and Pi uh, is and was uh, my Twitter and Instagram hashtag or username, I whatever, personality. And I did that, you know, how you do when you create usernames for yourself. You just kind of think of, you know, make a decision in the moment. And so when I signed up to Twitter 10 or 12 years ago, whenever that was, I was like, oh, my two favorite things, Art and Pi. And so then when I started freelancing, I was like, okay, I have to brand myself. You know, I have to be this thing that's sellable. And um, I, you know, thought of all these names of like creative, tried to do some, you know, like creative ideas about um, oral history and folklore and storytelling, all that kind of stuff. And then finally I was like, why break it if it, why, why fix it if it isn't broken? And so I realized that art and pie like the art is art, obviously, but then pie is really, to me, a metaphor for storytelling because it's about sharing and it's about hospitality, it's about connecting. And so um, I'll actually take you back to my website. I'll take the chance to take you back to my website. <laughs> and I have a, an explanation about art and pie and found the best stuff. So really, you know, it's things, these things are there all, al all along. Um, but if you want to spend time with my website, it's amysavins.com. And I have a whole thing about pie. Everybody asks me why pie. And this is why pie. So this is a beautiful Walker Evans Polaroid, which I love. And then this great quote from about Studs Tur Turkle, who's a really famous collector of American voices. Um, and then that just really spurred me on to continue um, with what I was doing was trying to connect art and storytelling. And then kind of by accident, um, not really by accident, but as a result of pure sentimentality and nostalgia, um, when I did come home and I resigned from the SFA and I had all this time on my hands, I started painting. And what I did was, you know, after being gone from Houston for 14 years, and just coming back at Christmas and you see the same people or go to the same restaurants that you miss living in Mississippi for a long time. Had a lot of Vietnamese food when I came back. Um, but I started noticing what was gone. And what, you know, I grew up, the neighborhood I grew up in, how it had changed, the neighborhood I lived in my 20s, how it had changed. And, you know, Houston is not a sentimental city at all. And so there were just a lot of things that I felt were a race that were really part of my memory bank of growing up here. And so I started painting those places. And the first place I painted was Tokyo Gardens Restaurant. Anybody in here have experience at Tokyo Gardens Restaurant? It was on Westheimer inside the West Loop by the Galleria. And it was amazing. Okay, so now the site where it was is an extended stay America hotel. But let me tell you about Tokyo Gardens. So this was a place where my parents took me when I was six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and it was this amazing expanse of a building with these large wooden poles holding it up, this traditional Japanese architecture. You walked in, a woman in geisha costume greeted you, there was a stage, there was a koi pond to the middle of the restaurant, to tommy mats where you took off your shoes and sat on the floor. I mean, like, it was, it was like going to another world. And this is, this is a peak of the interior inside, those red lacquered poles, and that's a, the koi pond she's standing in front of. And that's from a postcard um, of Tokyo Gardens from 1966. So I made this painting, and this was my memory of it. The patterns, the shoes under the little cubbies, um, the koi pond, the geisha dancers, performers, and then the hostess would always give me a little box of the botan rice candy when I left. So those were kind of the piecemeal, me piecemeal memories that I had of the place. And as I started kind of digging into somehow trying to validate my memories of the place, really see what it looked like, you know, looking at Google images and stuff, I was like, this is research, you know, this is documentary research. Why, like, I'm totally coming in through another door. 
and the stories were so amazing. Like I found the obituary of Hisako Gondo, who was one of the owners, that said Hisako and Jutaro Gondo brought Japanese architects and carpenters to Houston to build the interior of the restaurant in the traditional Japanese style of elaborate wooden joints and shoji screens, and it was here that the first sushi bar in Texas was introduced. But what is more than that? I found out that the owners were interned in a, an internment camp in Arkansas during the Second World War. They made it to Dallas, opened the first Japanese restaurant in Dallas, came to Houston, opened the first sushi restaurant in Houston, and were like the most successful entrepreneurs and of, you know, went to the extreme of flying in traditional uh, carpenters from Japan and created this amazing place. Their son is now known as the Sushi King of Houston and has Tokyo Gardens catering and supplies all the HEBs with sushi. So, I mean, it like, two, just two generations of history touches on all of that. So, this not only was the first painting that I did in the series, but it's the painting that inspired me to dig deeper. And then these really crazy things started happening. I'm gonna jump ahead. We'll go back. I wanna get to, is it really at the end? Yes, it really is at the end, okay. So, since leaving Mississippi, I was invited to be on the editorial board of Mississippi Folklife, which is the project, project of the Mississippi Arts Commission. Um, it's an online publication, it's great, Google it. And so, we're just kind of trying to build our um, our content and soliciting pieces. If anybody wants to write about Mississippi, please come find me later. Um, and I manage the custom. But so I, I wrote a piece for Mississippi Folklife because I presented some of my work, this work, to a group of Rice alumni. I spoke about the Mississippi Delta. A woman came up to me afterwards, said, I'm from Cleveland, Mississippi, which is in the Delta. Do you know so-and-so, Bobby Joe Moon? He's one of, from the long tradition of Japanese, or Chinese grocers in the Mississippi Delta. An amazing New York Times article just came out about these two young Japanese photographers who went through the Mississippi Delta and documented, or Chinese, we were just talking about Tokyo Gardens and now I'm totally stuck there. Um, documenting the Chinese families in the Delta who were grocery store owners long, anyway. So I heard about this connection with this Chinese guy who's from the Mississippi Delta in Houston and I knew I wanted to reach out to him. So I reached out to him and that's Bobby Joe Moon here in the blue shirt. And we got on like a house on fire. He gets on, along with everybody like a house on fire. He's just amazing. So I sat with him, you know, said I wanna write about, I wanna tell your story for Mississippi Folk Life. Your connection to Mississippi, your life here in Houston. And he and his wife took me to lunch in Asia Town. We got to talking, talking about Chinese food they ordered. It was like, oh, I grew up going to Swan Din Restaurant in Rice Village, and that's the Chinese restaurant I grew up on, you know, with sweet and sour pork and spare ribs and rice. And he said, oh, the Lu family. And I said, yes, Leon and or, uh, Helen and Willie Lu. Yeah, well, their son Leon is a friend of mine because the Chinese community in Houston is really okay. big, but really tight. So, so anyway, long story short, he knows Leon Liu, who is the son of the family that used to have Swandin Restaurant in Rice Village, where I used to eat as a kid. So we, he texted him that night. I connected with Leon, amazing. So he actually was the first interview I did um, for the oral history component to this art project. And so this is one of his memories about the place. So if you need, does anybody know where Prego is in the Rice Village, Prego restaurant? So Swandin was in that same block, but a little on the other end towards closer to Kirby. And so I asked him to like, you know, share his memories of the neighborhood, because I really wanted to paint a picture of Rice Village as, which was amazing. They did a whole hog and they had all these Chinese dishes, and then they had apple pie. It was so great. <laughs> um, and they, they, both Leon and Bobby have really taken me in. Um, but so I hope that you'll look for the article on Bobby on Mississippi Folk Life. 
www.bobbyjoemoon.org, I believe it is. He's got an amazing story, and the title of the piece is The Education of Bobby Joe Moon, and so it really is, it's a little bit about food, it's a little about, a bit about Chinese immigration to the Mississippi Delta, but it's a lot about um, education, uh, which was a really fascinating connection point uh, between his life in Mississippi and his life here. Um, so, but the painting that I did in 2015 uh, is my memory of the Swan Den. It was in this, you know, at the time, just this little box of a place. Um, they had these, you know, screens with this kind of brocade material. They had all those Chinese lanterns hanging from the ceiling. The ceiling was like um, a sprayed, textured ceiling, but it had silver glitter in it. So there's silver glitter on the, the left side of the painting in the background. And then my dad, he was a Navy man, and he um, put ketchup and soy sauce on everything. And he used to always tease me when I was little and call um, soy sauce dragon's blood. So that was a real part of the, the piece for me. Um, but then the night that, the day that Bobby Joe Moon told me that he knew Leon Liu and connected us on a text thread, I texted a picture of the painting. And Leon's first reaction was, um, I wish you could have, I wish my parents could see this and may God bless you for these memories because they're, they're magic. He was really, it was really sweet. And so well, he was my first or formal oral history interview for the project. And this was just uh, last summer um, because he was the first person that I had a, f a personal connection point with because of the serendipitous, serendipitous connection with Bobby Joe Moon. Um, but so we sat down for the interview and I wanted to get his kind of lay of the land of the Rice Village area, which as you now know it has a gap and a Banana Republic and it's getting even fancier by the minute. But when I was growing up, the Village Theater was an X-rated movie theater. There was a beer joint across the street. There was a pool hall a couple blocks away. Um, and it was just a little, you know, rough around the edges, um, but a, an amazing place. And I grew up just a few blocks from there. So I was a latchkey kid. I spent a lot of time walking the streets of the village. Um, but so when I asked Leon about his memories of the village and of the place and of the other stores that were there, he started talking about this business, Village Toys and Gifts. It was right here next to the X-rated movie theater. Um, <laughs> and this was a real, revelation for me, this conversation, because I had really been compartmentalizing all of these places and all of these memories and, you know, just working in my own head. And then when I spoke to him, when he, one of the first businesses he mentioned was World Toy and Gifts because Miss Rose Behar and Miss Adelaide Friedman were regulars at the Swan Den. And that kind of blew my mind. I was like, oh my gosh, these old women who, I mean, they were not really necessarily old when I was little, but we saw them as ancient, of course. Um, they used to eat Chinese food, like that was really cool. And then the fact that he knew Leon and his family, because Leon, and, and when I met Leon in person last year, I was like, oh my gosh, I totally remember you. He was 16 when he worked at his family's restaurant and wait, would wait on my dad and me. And I totally recognized his face. So this, when he's talking about Ms. Rose and Ms. Um, Friedman, they had the toy shop, they came in all of the time, they would always say, make us whatever you're having. They were like grandmothers. When I got en engaged, I invited them to my wedding. So that was a really cool kind of layering of stories for me um, and helped me again proceed with the project. But I'm gonna go back a little bit because the first paintings in the series Um, you know, I was working without considering this, uh, you know, a well-rounded documentary project. I was just making paintings. Um, and so this, this is actually a picture I took in 2002 when I was home from graduate school. And I was uh, probably in the documentary photography class and I was like, oh, look, the village is changing. I remember that same visit. Um, Alfred's restaurant used to be on Rice Boulevard and they were doing some construction and they had revealed this wall that had this mural um, for Alfred's and I took a picture of that too and I just took a picture of this because I've always loved this building um, because it's its orientation is to the corner um, and it just you know it has a lot of character I just I just liked it and then it's one of those things that 13 years later this is now a real estate office Hunter Real Estate Group thankfully 
they're in the same building. They did not demolish it to create something new and fancy, but they're actually working in the old beauty shop. So the beauty shop um, was owned by Edith Rhodes, who was by all accounts an amazing woman. And her um, grand one of her granddaughters lives in Dallas, and I'm trying to get an interview with her. But so uh, this was a great little bit of uh, information I found from the Houston Chronicle from 2004. Rhodes has seen a lot of things change over the years and not just the type of equipment. In 1968, when the Sisters of Charity at St. Michael's went from wearing habits to regular clothes, she gave 11 of the nuns perms. Um, and she claims to have invented the Marcel wave, which is that kind of 1920s, 1930s wave in a woman's hair and you use these long clips to kind of make these lines in, in your hair. And um, when I think of old women, I think of hard candy. And so I gave her a little butterscotch with her Breck hairspray. Um, but anyway, you can see how my palette for the painting mimics the palette of the environment that inspired it. Um, and then two, for all of the paintings, as part of the title of the painting, and is also written on the reverse of every painting, is this identifying information. Because once I started realizing that I was, I was kind of conjuring up the history of these places, I wanted to kind of put them back on the, onto the historical record and, and have them be, you know, memories of these places gone by, but kind of reintroduced in 2015 when I started the series. So everything has the physical address of the place, the years of operation, the owner, um, and what it is now. And in some cases, the architect is important, so I mentioned that also. <coughs> And this is Craig's, which anybody shop at Urban Outfitters in Rice Village? It was once this Craig's department store. And when I was little, this, this picture is from the 80s, but it looks so ancient, it, <laughs> it really gets me. Um, but so Craig's was this ladies boutique and I'd go in there with my mom and they had like hats and buttons and gloves and girdles and you know, all manner of old lady stuff. And it had two levels and you walk up this windy staircase. It was really fancy. Um, and I always love the sign and that font, that script that's used in the sign. And so that is my painting in response to Craig's. But then come to find out the architect also designed the Minkum Fountain, also designed a Miller Outdoor Theater. So a very celebrated architect who has created some of the iconic locations within Houston designed this lady's boutique, probably early in his career, or he knew somebody, you know. Um, so I have his name, Eugene Whirlin, architect, uh, mentioned there. So Lisa Gray wrote in 2016, the fountain at the center of the roundabout where Main Street meets Montrose Boulevard is the rare hard edge modernist artwork that inspires love. Since 1964, brides and quince girls have braved traffic to use it as a portrait backdrop. So I love kind of continuing that circle of, um, you know, women's wear, appearance, um, kind of a throwback. Oh, and this, now is a time where I can share some of my um, archival work. I'm going to show you this, and then I'll tell you more about it in a minute. In a minute. Oh, I didn't want you to see that yet. Craig's, it was a chain. It you can't see it yet. Good. Maybe I'll wait to do that, since now I've messed it up. OK, we'll stay with this. Come on, change now. OK, OK. I'll do that when I'm done with this, so I can close it out. OK, so this is a painting that I did a year later in 2016. I decided to keep the project going, the painting going, the fieldwork going. And this is a second interview I did because when I was doing internet research to find names associated with this place, um, I ran across the name Marcia Thomason, um, who was a bartender there. And so I you know, put her name in Facebook and found out that we had mutual friends sent her a note, sat down with her um, to talk about her memories of the Aquarium Lounge. But so the Aquarium Lounge was, you know, where Piggy's is, the new restaurant on, I think it's West Dallas and Dunleavy over there. It used to be Daily Re Review Cafe years ago. 
So in the 90s, I waited tables at the Daily Review Cafe. After our shift, we would go around the corner to West Dallas to um, the Aquarium Lounge, total dive bar, bar, totally awesome. And I spent a lot of time there in the 90s. And then when I left Houston, um, there were these Houston Press articles about Miss Ruth retiring. And so they did like a, you know, oh, we're sad to see you go interview with Ruth Bush. Then like literally one or two weeks later, she died. So then they had her obituary in the Houston Press like one or two weeks later. So, but her story is amazing. And she was, you know, this is like female entrepreneurship, bartending, service industry, uh, Montrose, Midtown. Um, she had a lot of female bartenders and she was like uh, a mother or grandmother to the employees and the regulars who worked there. And so she had, the, the story is that when she, she had a bar in the Heights, but then she left the Heights because she didn't like the neighborhood where she was and she came to West Dallas. She found a fish tank on the street, installed it as like the first decoration in her new dive bar and it became, filled it with fish, it became known as the Aquarium Lounge. And then there was an Elvis impersonator in, in town who when he retired, he donated all his Elvis stuff to her. She had that all over the bar. Um, and just, uh, just a really cool woman. And she, uh, in the early days and on late nights, she had a mattress in the back and she would sleep in the back of the bar. Um, and she did that in the early days so she could pay, you know, just one rent and live there and do business out of the front. Um, and then I guess later when it was convenient when she got older. Um, but so Marsha had a lot of amazing memories and Marsha is an amazing story in of, of herself because she was a student at U of H. She majored in um, Middle Eastern studies, is fluent in Arabic, was a fixer, and would, would go with regulars who came to their aquarium lounge, hired her as a fixer to take, her on, take them on a trip to the Middle East because she had spent a lot of time over there. Um, she's just, she's, she's amazing. She has an amazing story in of herself. But she had all these memories about Miss Ruth and brought these photo albums, um, and this is, um, a picture they took at her wake after she died, um, painted inside the, the building, the house that Ruth built. Really cool interview. Um, and then this is Swanden. And then mm, I'll exit this. Come back. Okay. Um, and so you remember Tokyo Gardens, the Japanese restaurant where they flew in the craftsmen um, from Japan to build the place. They also uh, flew in traditional dancers and performers. They had a stage at the end of the koi pond and they would have performances every Friday and Saturday night, if memory serves. Um, and so this is something that happened, another serendipitous moment. When I presented this work in the fall, um, the Oral History Association had its annual meeting um, and the theme of it for last year was oral history and new audiences. And so I sent in my project to propose to be a, a presenter at the conference and was accepted and I presented and the meeting was in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So I'm presenting this project about Houston, oral history, archival research, all this kind of stuff. A woman approaches me after my talk. I'm an archivist at the Houston Metropolitan Research Center. Would you like to work together on this. Absolutely, yes. So when I got home, her, aim is, her name is uh, Eberschner, and we spent a little bit of time, you know, she knew what I was working with um, and had a sense of, you know, the big picture of the, the village, bigger picture of Houston, some names of some places. And she just did kind of a pre preliminary scan of their archive and gathered a bunch of stuff from the Houston Post collection. This used to be a two newspaper town and so, it used to be the Houston Post and the Houston Chronicle, now it's just Chronicle. So Houston Post archives are there. And just, she found the most amazing stuff. And so there's a whole just treasure trove of images from um, Tokyo Gardens. And I don't have them all, I have this one because I paid for it to use in a paper that I submitted to um, a publication. But, um, and so then you saw the Craig's one and then remember Swanden and Leon Lee was talking about the old ladies who had the toy store. This is a photograph from the toy store. And I didn't talk about them. This is an amazing story. So Miss Ruth and Miss Friedman, Miss Ruth Bear and um, 
Adelaide Friedman, they had this toy store next to the X-rated movie theater, and it was kind of like um, a warehouse inside. I, I chose this picture because it shows the tall shelves in the back with all the inventory stacked. Like merchandising was not their thing. They just had inventory. And so they had like open boxes with like maybe a peek into what something was, but they just, they knew every nook and cranny. If you were looking at something, they would find it and ask their tall male helper to get it from a high shelf. But uh, Miss Rose and Miss Friedman, we as kids were really intimidated by them because they were very stern old ladies and we thought, why do they have a toy store? We were also intimidated by Miss Friedman who would sit at the cash register and it was like this low table, I have such vivid memories, this little cash register and a really big woman and always very stern and she had a tattoo on her arm. She it was a concentration camp number. So she was a concentration camp survivor running a toy store next to an X-rated movie theater in Houston, Texas in the latter half of the 20th century, which just blows my mind. And she ate Chinese food regularly at the Swan Den. So even just that little encapsulation just blows my mind. So um, it closed. I'm trying to think of when it closed. But I think Ms. Friedman died and then Ms. Behar retired, I think, is how that went. Um, and then I'm going to show you a couple more things. One is another one of these slides at the end because this, um, I'm just going to give that view so I don't mess anything up. But this project has been, you know, it's an ongoing project, obviously. I started it just kind of by accident in 2015. It has grown into something else. And I've just been kind of picking away at it because of my own personal interest in it of how it's been received. Like when I, when I submitted a proposal to the Oral History Association in, I submitted the proposal last spring. So, you know, like six months prior to the meeting. And I was like, well, if they accept it, I'll keep going. Like if they get it, I'll keep going with this. Well, they got it and I pre presented it, got a lot of feedback. Then I met the archivist at the Houston Metropolitan Research Center. Then I sat with her and saw all these gorgeous negatives of all these photographs from all these places. And I was like, okay. And I actually like cried when we were looking at one of these negatives because like, oh my gosh, this is like, it's totally affirming of my memories and it's totally the connection I need to make with the project. And it just gives me a whole new tre treasure trove of archival materials to layer into what I'm already doing. Um, and it, you know, spurred me. And then I met, you know, Bobby Joe Moon and he knew Liam Liu and that got me with the interview. Um, and then also after presenting, at um, the Oral History Association's meeting, I was invited to submit this work as an article for the Southern Quarterly. So I did this, it's like a 4,000 word article with all these great archival images that's in peer review right now. So that is expected to be published um, next month. And so like all these things have happened, all these things keep telling me to keep with it. But since I am not affiliated with an organization and I am just me over here doing this, um, I've been seeking funding to kind of keep it going because that's the thing I need right now. So um, I'm seeking some grants and some, oh, and another cool thing that happened. Here's another cool thing that happened. So uh, a woman who is the art director at Rice Magazine for Rice University posted a thing on Facebook. These are some good Facebook stories. We were talking bad Facebook stories during the fire drill. Um, she posted about how Rice is doing uh, an article about the old village. And does anybody have any old personal family photographs of the village over the years? Well, a friend of mine tagged me on this post knowing that I had this work. I get to talking to the art director. She loves my work. She buys one of my prints. Yay. And then she comes back around and she's like, look, I, I can't really find all the images that I want. May I invite you to illustrate the piece? So here's another connection with another random thing that pops up that has to do with the project I'm working on that is another thing that spurs me along. Um, so that's, I mean, and actually my deadline is next week for that. So that's what I'm currently working on in relationship to this project. But I wanted to show this because, you know, I started doing the paintings in 2015. I had some people who came to experience the work just strictly as paintings, not as historical documents. Um, and then as I, as I was convincing myself to treat this as a documentary project, then I started reaching out and uh, you know, presented the Oral History Association's annual meeting. I actually randomly came across this uh, exhibit in North Carolina 
that had a call for, in, in, for, for entries and their whole concept for the exhibit was documentary is art. Um, did a thing on Open Journal prior to the Houston Eats Conference. So there are just like so many connection points to this project that I'm trying to capitalize on and that are really proving to be fruitful um, connection points and collaborations. And so, and this is what's coming out in April 2017. But so I'm just, I'm really now building my own personal archive, collecting work, organizing work, um, and still trying to conduct interviews when I can. Um, nothing is transcribed, so it's really very piecemeal. But again, it's a labor of love, and it's kind of the thing that runs parallel to my make a living life, um, which is really satisfying. And then um, I wanted to show you, too, that my most recent group of paintings, because I'm still painting, and it's still great that I still get to do a lot of work um, and have time to do it and make time to do it. But this, Sacred Spaces, is my most recent body of work, and it is all about places that still exist in the Houston landscape, because I decided I wanted to do something rooted more in the present than in the past, which I, I, I really love working in the past. But, um, and this also was born out of my experience traveling all over Houston as a teaching artist and teaching writer with um, four different arts integration nonprofits in town. And so I am out 290, I'm up on the north side, I've taught over in Highlands, Texas, over by Baytown, I'm down on the southwest side, I'm down in South Park, I'm all over the city. And so I always love taking photographs wherever I am, everybody loves Instagram, right? And so whenever I see something that catches my eye, I'll document it. And so I started noticing that I was taking pictures of all of these um, examples of vernacular architecture. And while my Houston was and still is a project of, of businesses and locations and family owned businesses and spaces that no longer exist or have been transformed so much that they're unrecognizable, this was a, a moment where I was seeing things that do exist but are in great threat of disappearing because of gentrification and you know expansion and all the things that Houston has always wrestled with but is really wrestling with right now so this is not in Houston though I, I trick you with the first image this was the this was the location that inspired the project because this I travel to Mississippi a lot still um, and this building exists in Chula Mississippi and it is just something that like, you know, it's a million miles long, has been added on to every 10 years and a, diff a different person with different materials. And it's just a real, it's like a sculpture in the landscape and it's painted bright purple. Um, and so that, that building inspired the project, but I'm hoping that y'all will recognize this place. Anybody go to the cream burger? Yeah, so the cream burger is, it's a really magical corner of Houston. You know, it's something that is really overpowered by the light rail and traffic and cement and the university. But cream burger has been open since the 60s and it's just like held together by grease and paint, you know? <laughs> and um, the other thing, like it's my favorite corner in Houston too because around the corner um, there's this residential home that's a Le bungalow that's painted blue and the guy has all this yard art there with rocks rock arrangements and fish sculptures and there's a surfboard and he has these big plastic Christmas balls hanging from the tree um, and so that is a celebration of that specific space uh, and I'll show you another one this is over on telephone road uh, the beauty salon with the taco truck in front very Houston this is on Park Place Boulevard Park Place shoe repair I don't know if any of y'all go drinking at Lola's Depot. Um, but you'll see it's all about, you know, my paintings obviously have a lot to do with color. Big fan, color. And so, you know, these are moments in the environment. Here's Light Bulbs Unlimited. You know, moments where there is this really specific expression of place and products and, and, and the person who is navigating that space. Um, and so this has been a really fun, fun group of paintings to work on. I um, feel like there was one more thing I was going to, oh yeah, there is one more thing I was going to show you. So, and a whole nother part of my, my schizophrenic life, uh, personal and professional, <laughs> um, 
before I was painting paintings about Houston, I was just painting these kind of narrative still lifes and did that for a bit good years, amassed quite a big body of work of these narrative still lifes. And I have just partnered with a friend of mine who's a chef in Mississippi, and we are doing a book together where my paintings are illustrations for the recipes and my titles of my paintings inspire the head notes for the recipes. And it comes out in, for Mother's Day 2019. And it's a good meal, it's hard to find. So I hope from all of that you will see that you can marry art with oral history and oral history with art and photography with art and oral history. Um, but my main takeaway for today is to talk to strangers because that is where the magic happens, okay? So now I would very much like to hear from y'all and either answer questions about what you've seen here, life in general, conducting field work, what's your favorite pie? You tell me. Yeah. Yes, because that is what everybody, yeah, talks about, about Lola's, the bathrooms, yeah, with the graffiti and the multiple rolls of, t yeah, toilet paper is not easy to paint, a roll of toilet paper, <laughs> I'm here to tell you, here to tell you. I also have a daughter who's eight years old and I snuck her name into the graffiti and uh, when my mom came to my house, she wanted to see what I was working on. I was right in the middle of completing paintings for the show and I had that one on my easel. She's like, oh, I wanna see what you're working on. And sh she saw that and she's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is what you're working on, okay. <laughs> yes. Do you, could you see yourself in the future ever um, doing a project like this in a different city or for a different city? Or do you feel like the personal connection to Houston is what's making so great for you and your life. I think that definitely the personal connection and the just kind of the organic development of the project, I mean, that speaks a lot to how the project progressed. And so it is very near and dear to me. I am realizing I need to change the title of it um, for, because I would ultimately, I'd like to, it to be a book. And when it's a book, it's not all about me, even though I'm part of the narrative because of how things kind of unfolded. Um, so there's that, it's just an aside. but. Uh, that's interesting that you say that because I don't know you know that it could be like um, the, the new the new tourism <laughs> is uh, uh, seeing places through paint and oral history um, but you know I had it's also interesting you say that because in my first exhibit of this work a guy and his wife came to the art opening at Kelch Gallery and they do like a bike tour of Houston and they're like oh it'd be so cool if you had plotted map points to all these places that you could visit and see what it is now and know about what it was then, which is also very cool. I mean, there are so many options with technology now, but um, that would be cool. I will think about it now. I hadn't thought about it before, but I like it. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't know any other place as well as I know Houston, so there's that part of it. Um, but I think I have gotten some personal commissions as a result of this work. Like, it's gotten people to think about where they came from and what they miss and and having them kind of keep a piece of it in some form, which has been fun. Yeah. As an entrepreneur, did you ever have difficulties like sustaining yourself? And if you did, how did you kind of overcome those ones? Uh, yeah, I had a hard time paying my rent last month because rent in Houston is high. Um, but yeah, it's always chasing the next, next thing. You know, freelance is a constant hustle and, you know, everybody's in the gig economy and all of that. But, you know, the next thing always kind of comes. It's really impossible to always believe that, but it, it really does. And, you know, I have loved being able to teach the work that I do with the arts integration nonprofits. Like, it's work that I was passionate about before I went to graduate school. And then in graduate school, I sought out opportunities to teach because I missed that, that interaction with people. Um, and so I really love teaching, uh, and I don't, I don't know that I could ever totally give that up, but that's where, I, you know, that's how I make a regular living, um, is being contract with those organizations, and then I have to kind of treat the rest as gravy, so it's nice when there's gravy. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I'm also from Texas, and I remember all their Houston and Dallas completely 
Yeah. Like so many like niche down home restaurants. Yeah, like all the family in place. You know, I saw a friend of mine in uh, San Francisco, but was talking about the Castro neighborhood, the rents for this beloved uh, taqueria. I'm not sure, but it was a, a Mexican Hispanic restaurant of some time, some sort. Um, they were forced out for rents and the, because the rent was so high, but now they've reduced the rent because they can't get a tenant. So the, a lot of that is happening here in Houston, where like a uh, good example is Tila's Mexican restaurant that was on the curve on Shepherd right there at uh, West Dallas. She, she, had, she had been there for like 12 years, had a painting of mine in the hallway to the bathroom. I mean, seriously, and she was forced out but due to high rent, even though she had been a, a tenant there for 12 years and is now just doing her food truck, which you've probably seen around that her tacos are made by Mayan virgins. Great advertising. Um, um, but yeah, so old Houston. We know what's interesting is that I myself have capitalized on the statistic of Houston being the most diverse city in the country. But what's so interesting is that that has always been here you know there was always you know it had to start from something and so like Tokyo Gardens was iconic in the 60s 70s 80s Kim Sun which is now like a mall of a Vietnamese restaurant it was a tiny little place over there in old Chinatown east of downtown um, east of downtown didn't exist is what it is you know um, so I think it is still there but I, I think what I see Houston doing and every every place is doing this but it just chases the trends man you know like it's just it's always looking at the next thing. It's never celebrating what's already here. Um, and so that's, that's where I see a disconnect. Um, so frequent the places that have been good. Go to the cream burger. <laughs> Let's keep the cream burger alive. What else you got? Yes. Uh, I have a question about the oral histories marrying the art. Do, do you ever find the stories that come from those interviews inspiring the art? Either, either, I don't know, in an abstract way or maybe in the objects that you feature in the piece? No, so far the, all the paintings have come first and I'm moving at such a snail's pace that I haven't gotten ahead of myself with the interviews. So, um, but it is, you know, and it's kind of one of the rules of oral history is you ask one narrator to suggest another narrator and another another. So whoever I'd speak to, I'm like, what do you remember? Who do you know? What am I not remembering, you know? And so kind of amass this list of um, possible subjects, but then I haven't gotten past the painting part. You know, I mean, like the painting still always comes first. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how your arts integration work? Because I'm thinking about like when you worked at Cashmere uh -huh. Gardens and you did that wonderful Harlem Renaissance, uh -huh. those beautiful kids. Can you uh -huh. talk about how that part of your practice fits in with this? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so, having a background in fine art and then an MA in Southern Studies, which is a cultural studies program, that has totally informed my teaching. And so I love, you know, and I said that I, I gravitated to the Southern Studies program because of its interdisciplinary nature. And so that is how I like to teach, and that's how I hope that students learn. So, my first, um, the first arts integration organization that I connected with uh, was Literacy Through Photography, which is the teaching arm of PhotoFest. And right now, the PhotoFest Biennial is going on all over Houston, so go see it. It's amazing. The theme is India. Amazing artists from India have contributed to that exhibit that covers the city. Um, but anyway, so they were the first organization that I started teaching with, and one of my early residencies was at uh, Kashmir Gardens Elementary. And so Literacy Through Photography looks um, at using photography as a way, like we, we want people to be able to read photographs and decode photographs and learn from photographs, but then also use photographs as a prompt for writing. So especially with elementary age kids to get them kind of inspired about writing in a new and different way where we're kind of teasing, you know, tricking them into writing um, for lack of a better phrase, but it ends up being that. Um, but so I was with this group of fourth graders at Kashmir Gardens Elementary and their teacher um, I always have a classroom teacher who's, you know, my collaborator throughout my residency because they know the kids and um, some of them like to work <coughs> with me more than others, but this classroom teacher and, and I got along really well and she was from New Orleans, she was a singer, like she brought all this to the classroom, it was amazing. And so I saw an opportunity, one for these students to see themselves in photographs and have a professional photographer take their photographs. 
Um, but then also for them, there were, there were a lot of things going there. So it was photo, photo, uh, Literacy Through Photography's 20th anniversary. So we were looking on how to, or maybe it's 25th, how to um, acknowledge that. Um, and so I, and anyway, so I went in with this project with these kids to talk about the Harlem Renaissance, introduce them to a period of American history that was an amazing cultural and artistic renaissance, um, introduce them to some of those artists. And I did that in writers and actors um, and singers. I did that through the work of Carl Van Vechten, who's a photographer in Harlem um, during the heyday of the Harlem Renaissance and documented everybody from James Baldwin, Baldwin to Sarah Vaughan to Ella Fitzgerald. Um, to um, Harry Belafonte, all these luminaries of that era. And then I had them, um, I did a portrait project with them where I brought all these dress up clothes and they put on all these dress up clothes. And the thing about Carl Van Vechten's portraits is that he has all these amazing um, pattern backgrounds. It's right when color uh, film came out, Kodachrome. And so he, he totally capitalized on that, has all these amazing backdrops that are really vibrant and really pop, Zora Neale Hurston, you photograph. And so that's part of it. And I use a lot of patterning in my paintings, so I've already always loved his work. Anyway, brought all these fabrics, brought all these dress-up clothes, had the kids pose with these backgrounds, and then assumed the character of who they would be in 25 years. And so um, these really amazing portraits came out of it. They did these writing projects in response to it. And then my residency came to an end. And it was just, it was my, my first experience with literacy f through photography, because I didn't really know how it was supposed to work. But I was like, man, I'm just getting to know these kids. They've done this amazing work. I'm just getting to know the classroom teacher. You know, we played um, Ella Fitzgerald songs in the classroom. We played music. We listened to uh, poetry recited by James Baldwin. We listened and we watched videos. We did all this stuff. And I was like, man, this project is just getting going and my residency is coming to an, an end. So I went to Literacy Through Photography and I was like, because um, it's all grant funding for all of these residencies. And I said, would it be okay if I started a Kickstarter, like a personal fundraising project to continue this residency at the school because the funding had run out? And they were like, yeah, sure, that's fine. So I did a Kickstarter just for like $1,500 was asking for supplies and my time to be in the classroom for the next semester and got it in 24 hours and doubled it in like 36 hours. Um, and so part of my pitch for the Kickstarter was to create a traveling exhibit of the photographs. And um, I did exhibit the photographs at the Center for the City of in Mississippi. And back then when I had the time, I was trying to find a connection um, in Harlem to exhibit the work. And then all of us and me went on to other things. So that never came to fruition. But it was a really um, exciting project and great collaboration. The kids loved it. The school loved it. Literacy through photography loved it. And then that has kind of trickled through all my other residencies where I really, um, you know, right now I'm at Fleming Middle School and we're looking at, um, I'm in a sixth grade world history class. And so we're talking, it's with literacy through photography and we're talking about migration. So I'm talking to them about um, the great migration of African Americans from the deep south to urban centers in the north to so show them their own, like talking about world history in the India curriculum with literacy through photography. And we have examples of documentation of migration patterns from Tibet to India and all this kind of stuff, but then bring it home so it can be more real to them. Um, and uh, then there's this beautiful, of I'm sure you all know Dorothea Lange's migrant mother photograph, like the most iconic image of our times. Um, then I don't know if you saw, I think it was like the March 18th of this year, Time Magazine cover about the immigration crisis. Look at those two images together. It's pretty phenomenal. Um, anyway, stuff like that. Yeah, with the kids, it's fun. Yes. I am going to be in, at the uh, Art Center in Lubbock this summer, <laughs> if you make your way out to Lubbock. Um, and, but no, I don't have another exhibit on the calendar. It's about time I have one at Kelch, but I haven't talked to her about that. Um, but if you go, if, just follow me on Twitter or Instagram, and I post anything there if you want to know any updates about shows or um, talks or ideas or pie. Um, on either of those spaces. My, I have a news section on my website, but it's really hard for me to remember to feed the beast, so it's not really uh, current. In fact, I think the last thing from there up there is from Harvey. Um, 
But anyway, yeah, thank you for asking. Oh, but you can see my work. Thank you for asking. You can see my work at um, Rec Room downtown. So Rec Room is um, a project of a young man who was married to a former student of mine. And so they invited me to hang some of my work in the bar adjacent to Rec Room where they have performances. They have like a little black box theater and they have some other alternative spaces in there. Really cool place. Um, and some of, a lot of the My Houston work is over there indefinitely until they kick me out. <laughs> yeah. Any questions about oral history, field work, cold calling people, turning your recorder on? Yes. for the My Houston project specifically? Um, I don't know, it kind of ran the gamut, because a lot of people, it's kind of the nature of the cold call, is they think you're from a, a newspaper, or they think you're um, a student, sorry. Uh, or, you know, even when I was a graduate student, I would say, you know, I'm, I'm working on this effort that will be part of the historical record archives with the University of Mississippi Library and kind of legitimize my big ask. Um, but with this project, man, everybody has been so cool and everybody has really been kind of overwhelmed, I think, at, at kicking up all these memories because I'm coming at it in a completely different way, in a completely personal way, you know, that it's, it's my memories associated with their place and then they, we kind of bounce back and forth. Um, and you know, when I, when I interviewed Marsha, the bartender, she started just bawling because she hadn't really thought about Ruth in a while, you know, and it was really emotional for her because she really loved that woman and that place and um, was really great. One of the interviews I'm, I've been trying to get for a long time, his wife just died, so I may not get it for a long time more, but um, Poor Man's Country Club was right across the street from the toy store and the, the movie theater and that guy has a really cool story and history. Um, it's just, it's, it's been really neat. It's kind of like somebody asking, I mean, this is what was gonna come out, but it sounds silly now that I'm wanting to say it out loud, but somebody asking about your favorite family pet, you know, you're like, oh, I haven't thought about them in a long time, but it's a family business or a personal business or the thing that, um, you know, Leon's memories of working in the restaurant, he didn't love working in the restaurant, but he loved his parents and he loved what his parents were doing for him by having the restaurant and, um, yeah, it's, it, and it's, it's created really deep connections for me personally with these people because we have the same connection to the place. You know, when I was doing oral history work for Southern Foodways Alliance, you know, I was just going to places that I'd never been before, asking people about their livelihoods and their background and not bringing any, anything else from my personal experience to the table. And this is all about my personal experience. So it's a very different interaction, absolutely. Amy, yes. Thank you all so much. Thanks for coming back after the fire drill. <laughs> thank you for listening to me. And if you think of a question later, please email me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay.